Okay, greetings. Good afternoon to all. Thank you for accepting our invitation to this webinar in English titled Cybersecurity, Preparing the Tape Hispanic Community for the Profession. We today presenters, uh, Amy Ransom and Lisanet Rosario from Ostos Community College. And also we have Mr. Shalom Cohen, president of Easy Tech Assist. Thank you all for your valuable collaboration with this initiative that aim to provide special support to member institutions as part of the HEADS mission to promote the integration of technology into higher education. And today we have more than 150 participants registered uh, from more than 20 higher education institutions in Puerto Rico, also in the United States. And we also have from international institutions like Universidad Cooperativa de Colombia, which is one of our member institutions, in international member institutions. Also, we have participants from the Department of Education in Puerto Rico and also from private colleges uh, and schools and organizations. Greetings to all. We hope that this webinar will be a great benefit to everyone. Before we start the webinar, we would like to share a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, we would like to, uh, for your convenience, we activate or uh, enable the closed captions are, are available in English for this webinar. To activate this feature, you just need to click the show, uh, the show uh, captions button that you will find uh, at the buttons on, um, on the Zoom uh, room. And please use the oh, but also use the chat to share the questions or comments. At the end, as you may know, we will have uh, between five to 10 minutes of a Q&A session. So you can share and, and ask questions to our speakers today. Also, please uh, use this, uh, keep your microphone on mute to avoid any interruptions. And we are kindly also asking you to stop your videos as well. So we don't have any of these uh, distractions during this webinar since we have three speakers today. Also uh, remember that uh, to, to uh, click on the link uh, to uh, request your certificate of participation, or you can also scan this QR code with your Mobiles. If you are in a computer, you can use the camera of your cellular uh, phone to go directly to the form. So you can please uh, complete the form so you can request the certificate of participation. Please make sure your name is spelled out correctly and also, but most important, your email, because if you have any mistake on your email, you will not be able to receive the certificate. Please allow one or two weeks to receive this certificate of participation as we always ask and we really appreciate your patience on this. Remember that at the end of this webinar, you will be receiving an email with a link to complete a short electronics uh, evaluation to help us evaluate this webinar and help us also identify which head services and initiatives can support not only your students, but also your colleagues and staff, and also your feedback to promote. And, and we would like to have your feedback in what is, which you think is the best way to promote these, these services among your academic community. This service is anonymous and the estimate time to complete it is around five minutes. So we will appreciate your time to complete this uh, evaluation. And remember that your feedback is very important to us. Finally, we invite you to help us uh, invite others to register and participate in our webinars and events. And next ones include, we remember that you can find all this information in our uh, menu at heads.org in the menu of next and past events. Remember that next events are the first ones that you will see. And then in past, you will see the repository of all the events that we will, we have held during this uh, year. 
uh, with their recordings of all these events. Next one's gonna be tomorrow. It's gonna be in Spanish with Dr. Juan Tito Melendez. It's gonna be at three from three to 4 p.m. Eastern time. And the topic will be que hacer con la educación a distancia. This webinar will be in Spanish, uh, of course, free of charge as all, as all our webinars. The next one's gonna be next Friday, 28, April 28. And it's gonna be in Spanish as well with uh, very, uh, three presenters from Universidad Texas Rio Grande Valley. And we will be talking about accessibility for all. And uh, next webinar will be Thursday, May 11. It's gonna be in English. And the topic will be building bridges, enhancing education to employment pathway through mutually and beneficially relationships with local businesses, faculty, and career services. And this time, two colleagues from La Guardia Community College will be uh, presenting. And finally, we will be talking with Dr. Juan Tito Melendez again, but this time in English, uh, with the same topic, what is to be done with this time education. That's going to be in June 1st. It's going to be a Thursday during the afternoon as well. And please, make sure that uh, you save the day. Soon you will be receiving the save the day for those interested in applying to participate in the June 2023 edition of the HEADS Learning Technology Leadership Academy. The HEADS Academy is a professional development program focused focus on developing the next generation of leaders to serve at Hispanic Service Institution to promote and facilitate the adoption of teaching and learning technologies. So please help us uh, share uh, with others this invitation so you can participate and benefit from this initiative as well. Also, we would like you to access and help us promote among your students and colleagues the Peterson Test Prep, where you can find scholarship practice tests and ebooks to get prepared for those tests, such as PCAT, LSAT for law school, DRE, NCAT for medicine school, and that among others, there is more than 100 uh, standardized tests that are there that you can practice before you take the real test, and also download the ebooks to get prepared. If you don't have the steps to access, this is very easy. You just click on the student placita, uh, click on the Peterson and Test Prep link, look for the name of your institution. When you click there, you are supposed to have the password of your institution. If you don't have it, please send us an email to info at or you can text uh, to my mobile 6787-613-616-3201 with your name. And your institution, please put the name of your institution so I can text you back the password of your institution. Also, we have the access uh, to totally free of charge to the Peterson Career Press, where you can search for jobs and internships, also create your resume and find career advice among other services. And this uh, the steps to access this is the same. Go to the student placita, click this time in the Peterson Career Press and look for the name of your institution. And again, if you don't have the access code or the passcode of your institution, please send us a text or an email. If you don't find the name of your institution there, you can also send us an email or a text because we can give you, uh, a, in the meantime, your institution a, a become a member of it so we can give you the access to a generic uh, code that we have, okay? Also, please finally uh, follow us in our social media account. We have a, a, a you can find us at heads.org in, in Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and in our heads YouTube channel, you can find the videos of all these uh, webinars that we offer and all the events that we held. Finally, now we are ready to start our webinar and I am pleased to present our guest speakers today. Let's start with Lisanet Rosario. Uh, Lisanet has over 20 years of experience in career development and higher education administration. Uh, 
uh, and she is the director of career services at Hostos Community College. And her commitment is aligned with the college mission of fostering student success, achievement, and persistence. Lisanet holds a bachelor's degree in English from Hunter College, a master of science in education degree from Baruch College, and is currently pursuing a PhD in literacy from St. John's University. Also, we have with us Professor and Squire Amy Ransom, and she has been a professor for 33 years in the parale Paralegal Studies and Criminal Justice programs at Ostos Community College. She's also an attorney admitted to practice in New York, a license on 1983, and also in Georgia, license on 1987. And she practices in immigration and international law. Her peer review articles and presentations at international conferences are on topics like online teaching, service, learning and assessment, and cybersecurity policy and education, among other topics. And finally, we have uh, or Amy and Lisanet invited Mr. Shalom Cohen, president of Easy Tech Assist, to be part of their presentation. So they, they will be presenting him during the webinar when we have their her part as his part, excuse me, as part of the presentation. So please go ahead, uh, Lisanet, sharing your presentation, and Amy, and Shalom, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to be part of this webinar today. So I will be, uh, you have until uh, 40 minutes, until uh, 3.50 or 55, so we can have five or 10 minutes left for Q&A sessions. Go ahead. Thank you, you bud, Keith. It's an honor to be here with each of you today. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to give this opportunity for Shalom to introduce himself and share a little bit about his background, and we'll get started with the webinar presentation. Thank you, Lizanette. And uh, thank you all. It's, it's actually an honor as well to be here today. Uh, I began my professional career back in the 1980s as a national engineer uh, for the Ninex Business Centers, where we managed uh, sort of the, the beginning of the evolution of the uh, computer age. Uh, my services were provided to the Fortune 500 uh, type of clientele with risk management, regulatory compliance, managed network services, infrastructure architecture, disaster recovery, and so on. And as the internet evolved, we realized there was a gap in the industry with respect to uh, the security and, and the cyber attacks that were happening. So uh, I, I commenced and began a company called Easy Tech Assist, which I am president of. And uh, we now handle cybersecurity matters and managed IT services. Uh, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Hostos uh, uh, since 2019 and uh, look forward to uh, further uh, uh, I guess, elaborating as, as we continue this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Shalom. And I'll begin with an introduction. Cybersecurity is a growing field that requires diverse talent. Hispanics are an untapped resource in this industry. And this presentation will explore how we can prepare more Hispanics for careers in cybersecurity and a little bit more about the Ostos Community College approach. We will review some of why, the whys, why is it important? Why is cybersecurity important for everyone? We'll be addressing the underrepresentation of Hispanics in the profession and then reviewing the Ostos approach. Amy. <coughs> Sorry, hi. Um, I'm very excited to be here. This is so wonderful with three of my very esteemed colleagues. Um, we are going to first really talk about the importance of cybersecurity, although I think that if you just open up any paper, <laughs> listen to any news, you're going to realize that that is probably one of the most important uh, crimes, problems in, um, in today and only getting worse. 
So um, Shalom. Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, uh, with the uh, the open, um, I, I guess, with the open network uh, philosophy as how the internet started, cybercrime has increased uh, tenfold. Um, and one of the things that, from an industry perspective, that we are looking for is talent, uh, talent at a very young age. And uh, this is one of the greater challenges that we're having uh, from an industry perspective. And also it's important for Ostos and us as a community college, um, part of our mission statement is to offer degree programs to the, our community to be determined to be a resource for the South Bronx and other communities served by the college, but also by providing continuing education and expertise to further develop our communities. Ostos Community College is in uh, one of the poorest congressional districts in the country. And here in the South Bronx, especially, we are seeing an increase in cyber crime. Um, so for us, it's only natural you know, to begin and to continue to expand programming in cybersecurity. And so what we find is when we um, educate our students, that since it's very close community, close families, they'll be speaking to their families, they'll be helping their families. Um, and so it really, it impacts the entire community. Okay. Yeah, so it, it, it does help foster this environment and collaboration and innovation as well um, to have a ripple effect far beyond the college campus. So this is really just giving you statistics um, about the security breaches, the cyber attacks. I mean, I think that this is even outdated. I mean, it's just proliferated. I know Shalom can also attest to that. And also the field itself is projected to grow just from 2021, 35%. And it's much uh, faster than many, many other occupations and then the salary is a very 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 decent salary um where the median salary is over a hundred thousand dollars but the students need to have the education and they need to have the certain certifications and hands-on um education to be hired and so that's really something that we've been focusing on because even if students are educated in cybersecurity, the firms will not hire them unless they have both the hands-on and the certifications. Correct, and, and more importantly also, uh, the government has made a push for the fact that they wanna see more uh, cybersecurity experts in the field or cybersecurity individuals. Um, and this is, uh, something that we've uh, we, we need to start by putting a foundation together and I think what Postos has done here has really put a, a foundation that they can build upon in any direction that they decide to go within the cybersecurity realm. So as we mentioned before, the field, the crime is growing exponentially and it's affecting everybody individuals companies the government educational institutions nonprofit institutions so it's really 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 affecting every single person and these are again just some statistics that 62% um, of all organizations have experienced um, attacks i'm sure it will increase uh, educational institutions ransomware attacks occur every day, um, especially we're very, very, very concerned about the, um, the ones that are going to harm our entire network. Um, and every company, every government uh, organization is a target. And um, federal, state, local governments, 
And if you look at the amount of money, the damages over eight trillion dollars. Just to expand a little bit more on that, um, in 2022 alone, uh, there were over uh, 26 U.S. district schools, uh, school districts, that were affected with ransomware. Uh, going back from a from a government push back in 2021, the Biden administration uh, officially made uh, ransomware a high priority risk, and this was after hackers had uh, broken in and, and manipulated a computer network belonging to the colonial colonial pipeline. So. Uh, we the the writing is on the wall, and, and we definitely need to prepare uh, from an earlier stage uh, and give our students the guidance they need, rather than having to them to go outside and try to figure these things out on their own. So obviously, if there's all this crime, all these issues. There is a tremendous demand for cybersecurity experts for, and what people have to understand is that it's a complete industry. So it's not just people who are coding, let's say, you know, um, it's an entire industry and there is a global shortage of over 3 million workers to date and over 800,000 um, jobs nationally that are unfilled. And basically one of the major reasons is that the recruitment is from two major sources, from educational programs and from the computer science field. And the problem is, as I mentioned before, that the educational programs lack the practical, uh, the, the students might lack the practical experience and the certifications. And so that's a very, very important thing to um, integrate into um, any educational program. And the other thing is that the computer science STEM field is heavily um, male, heavily um, white, which further restricts the recruitment. So it really, the field, the um, extent of recruitment has to be much more expansive. It has to include, for example, females, it has to include people from different groups. And that has been one of the sticking points. Yeah, so the workforce gap is a major concern and a major challenge for higher education institutions. Um, organizations and governments alike, and how are they going to fill these positions? This is why there needs to be an increased focus on recruitment, training, educational programs, and retaining also talent to help close this gap. Focusing also on creating awareness about cybersecurity and the benefits of a career in this field is very important, as well as increasing public awareness more, for more people to be encouraged to enter the field and it's clear that the cybersecurity workforce gap prevents, you know, this uh, represents this major challenge. And what we do at OSTOS is a small piece of the larger, you know, bucket of everything that's happening across the US. But in case you're interested, let's say, in doing something at your own college, whether it's a two year college, four year college, what we did, we started small with one course in one area and now we're expanding it to an entire program because mm -hmm. we wanted to introduce it as lisa net mentioned to our students and there there's such you know well there's such a need and there's such a demand for it that um our administration really was very keen on us starting a whole entire program so that's in the offing and we even um, went for, uh, we applied for a grant from the government because the government knows that it's extremely important for educational programs to be available for students in order to increase the workforce. And this slide just speaks to what you mentioned prior to the, uh, as you were speaking, Amy, regarding the gap in representation across uh, cybersecurity analysts. And the STEM field in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
so you can see the demographics it's it's between four to nine uh percent that's it are hispanic yet the population at least in it right mm -hmm. i mentioned okay so so the u.s hispanic latino population grew 23 percent compared to 4.3% growth for, for the non-Hispanic Latino population. And this comes from the census um, that was taken from 2010 to 2020. For us, this presents an opportunity to take advantage of this growth and increase our focus on innovation um, and cybersecurity and education initiatives within the Hispanic community. The time is now, population continues to grow. And um, this is this really the time to develop these types of programs that are equipped underrepresented individuals um, with these skills. And by increasing this representation, we can bring more diversity, more diverse perspectives to the field and continue to help protect against threats in a more effective way. Um, Especially in the STEM field, diversity has been shown to be extremely important for um, thinking of different ways to, to uh, attack a problem, for creative thinking. It's really necessary in every field, but especially in the STEM field, um, there's been um, authority on that. Okay. So how can we address the underrepresentation? I'm sorry. I may have skipped through a slide. The obstacles did we skip through? Yeah, I'm just one. Okay. Just bear with me. Addressing, addressing, I think. There we go. Right. Okay, so addressing the underrepresentation of Hispanics, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it absolutely um, creates a barrier uh, for the Hispanic community and um, it has to be, it has to be expanded. The field has to be expanded. And the problem for us, what we have noticed, especially, you know, as a college, is that the students coming from the high schools, whether it's uh, black and Latino students, they aren't even able to, um, they don't have the prerequisites to even start the programs because they're not offering the mathematics which is necessary for them to start the program. And that's been a very difficult thing for us to um, uh, over, to transcend. We do have some programming uh, in the math department where we do um, interface with high schools, but it's, you know, always the money, there's always a problem of financing. And we, and so it's kind of a small, um, program, which uh, at least some students are then going to be able to, before they get to the college, they're going to be able to take this mathematics. So that is one of the major problems, one of the major obstacles for um, allowing or, or getting people in the community to be able to go into a STEM or cybersecurity mm -hmm. field. As well as, I just wanted to add there, um, so based on some of the research that we had pulled, we found that 90% of districts primarily serving Black and Latinx students in the U.S. reported difficulties recruiting and retaining certified and knowledgeable STEM teachers. Shalom. No, what I was going to say also, one of the, from an, from an industry perspective, one of the things that's appealing to what Hostess has put together is the fact that they combine the law enforcement aspect of it, the math, uh, and so on. So I think that is very important to, to make sure that we keep a note of that. And uh, that's an important piece here. Yes, I believe we'll discuss that a little bit later. So how do we, again, addressing address this underrepresentation? And if we wanna make a significant impact on the engagement and success of Hispanics in cybersecurity, then of course, you know, we have to make the investments. So the colleges and organizations have to make these meaningful investments. Training opportunities should focus on providing hands-on experience. And we're gonna to touch a little more about this as well in our presentation 
on how we introduce students to cybersecurity through hands-on experiences, as well as networking opportunities and connecting with mentors in the field and coaches that can provide this guidance that students need um, and, and really helping support them as they transition from a student to a professional. Um, providing Hispanic students and really it's this edge in their career paths into cybersecurity. For some, it's a very new field. They're just learning about it. They may have experienced a cyber crime uh, or they may have learned you know, in a course in school about uh, cybersecurity, but it's still very limited and still very early um, in terms of the programs and the cert certifications and degree programs that are being offered. So I think- Yes, we, we have found, excuse me, we have found um, in offering this course that the students definitely need the peer mentoring or the coach mentoring, because if they don't have role models in their um, community, in their families, it's very, very intimidating. So um, that is an extraordinarily important piece that Lisa Nett mentioned. And without that, it would be probably um, very difficult to move ahead in this field. Yeah, and that's where that investment comes in, investing in faculty development, investing in career services staff development, as well as partnerships with industry and bringing the technology to the classrooms. It's very important to invest in technology to help bridge that gap between knowledge and experience for these professionals. So we're sharing here um, a study that was conducted at the University of West Georgia. This, again, information we're sharing, information we found through our research that helps helped us along the way. Um, and the purpose of this study was to assess how higher education institutions could help align their cybersecurity curriculum and practices with industry standards. And the researchers collected data from public universities in six states using a survey, and they supplemented that with interviews of the university's IT personnel. The results of the study reveal four key areas that higher education institutions should focus um, to help ensure their cybersecurity is up to date with industry standards. So focusing on curriculum and programming, um, including creating a culture of security, um, establishing and maintaining secure systems and developing the comprehensive curriculum. Um, so a lot of what this study found and what we were doing at OST or continue to do at OSTOS um, was right in line. And these are things that we're hearing more and more um, as we see the, the, the importance of the engagement with industry um, and academics. Yeah, it was very interesting that when we started with the cybersecurity um, course and when we started with bringing it um, to light was these were the things that we were doing and that we were finding, for example, um, and we'll talk about that more about the partnerships. And so it, you know, we were very heartened to see that this was actually there was authority for what we mm -hmm. had been doing. How did we begin to introduce the students? Because the majority of our students, we're HSI, but we have maybe 75% of our students are of the are Hispanic. Um, how did we introduce it? Okay, so what happened was um, Lisa, Ned, and I actually were able to um, be awarded this um, course innovation. It was it was both. It was it was course innovation plus career success grant opportunity that mm -hmm. CUNY Central. Um, if some of you don't know about CUNY, we have about 20, 22 schools. It's um, in New York City, and we have um, senior colleges, junior colleges, or community colleges. We have a law school, a med school, a graduate school. So it's a very um, diverse and large um, college system. And they, so time to time they offer, and so what they did was they offered a course innovation grant in cybersecurity and or um, 
uh, big data. So we applied and we got the course innovation. And as a result of that, we had to um, integrate it into a course that didn't have to go through curriculum because those of you at the university know that t curriculum can take a very long time to go through because it has to go through governance. Um, and so we had to do some, we had to um, integrate into a course that was already um, a course that had already gone through governance. So we incorporated it into uh, our criminal justice program course, which actually is a dual degree program. We have it with John Jay College, which is one of the best colleges or the best college in criminal justice in the country. And um, so the students transition right from Hostos to John Jay College. They don't even have to transfer as long as they fulfill all the requirements. And so it was incorporated into a course called Issues in Law Enforcement, which is really a multi-issue um, class where you introduce to the students uh, different you know, issues in criminal justice. And so this was just aligned perfectly with that course. And um, Lisa, and if you want to talk about the mentorship and the... We'll get to it in the coming slides. We'll get to it, okay. So mm -hmm. basically, as we mentioned before, mentorship is very, very important. And um, the, because we're gonna talk about it a little bit more in detail, the virtual apprenticeship. And basically it introduces the students to the extremely important soft skills. And then as a result of this whole course, with the mathematics and engineering professors in the mathematics department, I, with them, submitted uh, an NSF grant um, last, I think we did it last summer, and we're still waiting to hear, actually, to develop a program with peer mentoring and with a trajectory from the high school to the college to employment. And Shalom, I know you'd like to speak maybe a little bit about um, the industry and the soft skills. Absolutely. So uh, the industry is um, in desperate need uh, of the skills uh, that uh, Professor Rams was uh, discussing just a moment ago. And the challenges that we have uh, is uh, uh, as I noticed uh, when uh, presenting these lectures, they're reaching out to students and um, some students, uh, I guess, with the intimidation or the uh, uh, feeling of overwhelmed, of being overwhelmed, uh, tend to uh, shy away. And uh, we offer internships. Uh, a lot of companies are offering internships and hoping to continue developing these skill sets um, and uh, this as well has uh, remained a challenge for us. Yeah, I think as part of this course, what we realized more Amy than anything really realized was the connection between law enforcement and cybersecurity and how can we introduce that to students as they're pursuing a criminal justice degree and continuing their education to a senior college where they may be possibly integrating cybersecurity. Um, so we, again, we were thinking beyond the computer science curricula um, to include, and the focus of that was cybercrime, cybersecurity practices, policy, law enforcement, and corporate perspectives uh, in, in the course. And it was really customized for the needs of the college community. Yeah, I think that um, because it was initially incorporated into the criminal justice field, I think that made, um, it was a very good introduction because it was looking at it maybe from a different point of view than, than what people normally might think of as a pure computer, computer science degree, exactly what Lisa Nat was saying. And that that is very necessary to look at it from the, pol from, from, different points of view from the from the policy from the governmental from it being a crime so yes it is necessary to have you know people who do the coding and the computer science but it's also 
extremely necessary to to have this other point of view and even shalom when in his um lectures to my class he does talk about the legislation because that's that's something that they have to think about all the time and they have to contact the fbi you know right away etc so i think that that was something that kind of turned like people did not realize at the beginning like when we went for the grant we had to we were the only college in the, of all the colleges that that um, submitted that was doing it from a law enforcement or from government, and they were a little bit surprised, but the industry understood that that was very important, so they gave us the grant. And then Lisa Net. No well, part part of the work in working together, right, and and having this partnership was one that Professor Ramson and I already had an established relationship where I career services would present in the class, we connect our resources, but now this was diving deeper, um, really building more and, and expanding and building on that relationship. The work that it took to make it possible, we re researched industry, right? Who we wanted to connect with, who we needed to connect with. I sourced LinkedIn. Um, that was one of my go-to. Like I didn't have a cybersecurity contact because we didn't have a program. Um, we didn't have um, the, the industry partner yet. So through LinkedIn, I did a little research and I found a couple of contacts. I reached out to Shalom and we became uh, connected on LinkedIn. And from there, you know, we're here today. <laughs> um, and Amy has been instrumental as a faculty member in sustaining that partnership as well. Um, she has been instrumental in the contact, the outreach, bringing Shalom for the class presentations every semester. Just, this didn't stop, it wasn't a one-time thing. And this is what is important for us to let you know that it takes hours of work, follow-up, outreach, to make programs and, and, and revisions to courses and connections and partnerships work in the way that this is working. Um, so through this course and this grant, you know, it really was sort of the seed for us to continue to grow and expand the work that we're doing. And I think that's something that Lisa and I brought up that's very important is I am an attorney, but this was not my area of expertise. And even the math and the engineering, they, this is not their area of expertise. So we had to rely on industry um, shalom a lot. Thank you. And we had to rely on people to um, help us. So don't eat, don't think that you have to be a cybersecurity expert to even bring this in. That's one thing. And then you have to have the industry because you have to know what the industry needs. And that was the whole thing, I think, with um, the both the grant that we got and both with the NSF grant now also. They, um, you have to have the industry input because otherwise the students are not going to be prepared for the jobs. So through this approach and through this program and initiative and LinkedIn, <laughs> I found our other contact, um, which is a provides a virtual apprenticeship program through IQ4 and this, it was only natural for us that we had an industry uh, perspective, and now we found something that we can use for the students to have a practical experience. Um, and that's where we included the virtual uh, pre-apprenticeship course that students would take online through the semester um, and working together. And, and we're gonna elaborate more on what that is as well. Through yeah. the grant, we had the in-class speakers and mentors coming into the classroom, speaking directly to the students. And that continues today outside of the grant because the grant, um, it wasn't refunded, but we continued the work. Amy? And then, so I'm gonna speak a little bit more about that. I actually, I had the class today, which was, that's why I was running in from class. And um, we have, they have fantastic mentors. And so that's what Lisa and I was talking about. You, you really have to reach out to industry. So we had a mentor today that was like, in he had like 50 IT people under him and now he's semi-retired and he wanted to give back help. 
So um, what the students do is they're given a real life challenge, a real cybersecurity challenge, and then they are divided into teams. So they're getting the teamwork and they and in roles and they have specific roles and then they have to um, analyze through questions the uh, challenge and then each week they present so as if they're presenting to their bosses or to the they present to the mentors but it's as if they're presenting to the bosses so these are all the soft skills that one needs one needs the presentation skills the um, teamwork skills, the critical analysis skills, and each week when they present, they get some critique, which then they have to um, make their presentation better and better until it's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like a final presentation, and they're graded on that presentation as one of their exams. And the students also complete assessments, providing feedback on their performance. Um, they receive guidance as well throughout the time that they're completing the apprenticeship via their mentors. And this guidance is to help them improve their skills. Um, and they also receive a certificate of recognition once they have successfully completed all stages of the challenge. And along the way, as the mentors are uh, included within the, the virtual apprenticeship challenge, they also provide advice on best practices such as risk management, incident response, and threat analysis. Here, we just go in a little more into the, the mentorship and what is provided to students. Excuse me, just to let you know that we have a few questions mm -hmm. already on the chat, but you have uh, two or three minutes to uh, finish the presentation and start the Q&A. Oh, okay. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. In addition, in addition to, let's say, the, the cybersecurity substantive knowledge, the technical knowledge, and the mentorship and the soft skills, they also, um, we also bring in guest speakers, which I think is very important. So we bring it in, let's say, from the law enforcement, from the FBI or uh, data forensics, I brought in someone. So I think that's also very important so the students can get different points of view. So maybe the next slide. So I think we spoke to this before a little bit that you know the law enforcement is a uh, point of view is very, very important. And then it also informs them as far as their careers. So a lot of the work that goes into this, you know, when we think about what students are learning, these are competencies, uh, skills that are being gained, yet students aren't really aware of how to articulate those competencies or, or how can I reflect what I'm doing in my resume, in my LinkedIn profile. Um, the, the issues in law enforcement course provided this valuable hands-on learning experience but it also prepared the students for careers in cybersecurity. And the role of career services is to help students bridge that. Like, what, what does it mean? What are careers? What types of careers are there? What are the job titles? What does it take for me to become a professional, an analyst, or so forth? So learning about the different roles within cybersecurity um, helps students, whether they're interested in continuing their studies in cybersecurity or taking a certification, or just knowing the, and having the, that, that information. Um, part of the, they've also learned and gained some technical knowledge and skills along the way, um, as the challenge provides the participants with a broader understanding of the cybersecurity landscape. So this really helps our students become more marketable to potential employers. They see that they've taken this course. There's an, they're also um, um, linking you know, the, the issues in law enforcement with um, the cybersecurity and cybercrime. So it really helps them in demonstrating those competencies that they have completed an actual experience through the semester and they're able to articulate that through interviews. In addition to that, we provide the HAKU Grow with Google Career Readiness Program, which is new, which was just launched last year. And students are able to continue developing their digital skills along with their career readiness skills online um, and receive certificates for that as well. So connecting all of these resources 
help students really gain the confidence in their abilities, but also, you know, they prepare this portfolio of resources and trainings that they have taken while at Hostos. So there was a, there are some questions in the chat and I, I was just browsing through the um, question and I see that we were asking, asking about maintaining, how, how do we, how do we sustain these industry partnerships, um, commitment from industry, especially when there's several RFPs and grants that you'll see they require industry partnership. It's not easy. <laughs> I think Amy can speak to as well when we first started the grant and the initial partners that were given to us, um, we had challenges and we sought out our own and developed our own partners. Amy, did you want to add some? Yes, because um, the grant was supposed to be, you were supposed to get a partner and we got a partner, but the partner did not help us. And that was very, very frustrating. Um, because again, I'm not an expert in the area. And so we, well, Lisa Nett really was through the contact, she through the LinkedIn and is that how you got IQ4 also? Yes. She, she was able, and then we were able to kind of negotiate with them to give us, you know, at least one semester um, without uh, giving payment because you have to pay them. And so, you know, you have to do you have to always be reaching out. You have to always be um, asking for help. You have to be networking all the time. So we had Lisa Net put together for our, um, through the grant, a whole networking conference. Mm -hmm. And through those people who attended that conference, I have been able to keep up with them. And um, Shalom can speak to being a person that is an industry that helps us, how would you say that, what would you say that you do, well, or we did, or? From, from an industry perspective, I can say um, that there are those within the industry that can see a, a very, very big value in a relationship that we have uh, with Hostos in the sense that uh, without this collaboration, we're really jeopardizing our future. We really need to make sure that we embrace the youth. We need to make sure that we embrace academia and, and assist with whatever we can. And I have a passion for this area. And I just want to make sure that whatever input we can give from an industry perspective, we do so. And Hostess has done a great uh, job in putting it all together and bringing different perspectives from, from, from different points of view within, from within the industry which is also uh, I found to be very uh, interesting and very appealing. But you will have your challenges. Uh, not everyone in the industry is gonna jump for joy when you reach out to them, uh, and that's okay. There, but there are passionate uh, individuals out there that will certainly reach out and certainly provide you with the, the resources you're looking for. I'm certain of that. Another. Yes, yes we Thank have you. other questions at the at the that. end by Milagros that she asked about if it's a problem the language for Hispanic. That was at the middle of the webinar. Ah. Can you say the question? Yes, so I'm looking for it because we have a lot of- Okay, I have, uh, I have it. Is the problem yeah. with the Hispanic population a language problem? That's a great question. Based, I, I can only speak to the research and what we found and, and how we've worked with our own students. We have students who begin at an ESL level. Um, I don't think it's so much a language problem versus a edu educational programs, like limit limits in the educational program. So there are not as many programs that are preparing professionals for the field in cybersecurity. They're up and coming. They're, they're definitely growing now. But I think when we first started, even before that, it was very limited. Now you're seeing several certifications, short-term programs that students can accomplish. Um, in a small time frame, and still get into the field, get a high wage job, um, and then they can continue their education into a degree program to further that experience as well. Amy, did you want to share anything? Yeah, I mean, I don't really see it at all a language problem. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as okay, a great. But also talking about certification, Jose Ferrer asked below that question that 
if your recommendation is to prepare certificate programs, associate degree or bachelor degree in cybersecurity, which is best out of these three options? Okay, say that again. Your recommendation is to prepare a certificate programs uh -huh. or associate degree or bachelor degree in cybersecurity, which is best. Oh, okay. I, I we really all the above. It's, it's whatever you want. <laughs> you need. I think on. you. <laughs> you know, Shalom. What? What? What's the bet? Maybe for having someone that you would hire. I guess it would depend on what you're hiring them for, right? Correct. Um, so what? I found that was groundbreaking specifically with host of the fact that, again, the it, it's more of a complete uh, picture to what you're, you're providing and you're providing a strong foundation. That's the key, the foundation. Um, with, what respect, degree? With, with the respect to degrees, I will mm -hmm. tell you this, uh, whether they co they're coming from university or they're coming from outside within the field, uh, we go through a vetting process regardless. Uh, to, to ensure that they have the basics of what we're looking for, uh, depending on what level they're coming in at. But I think it would be a clear advantage if they certainly had a certificate from the, from the universities that they were attending. Uh, that that mm -hmm. is, a, is a good indication, at least for the industry, to know that there's a foundation already in place. Well, okay, certificate is a certificate pro program that's maybe usually like 26 credits. Well, you don't have to have, and then the, you know, and the associate's degree is 60 credits and then the college degree mm -hmm. is 120. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, mm -hmm. I think what this gentleman is asking, what would be a better program? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really, I, I don't know. I think industry would, you know, I don't yeah. know what they, what do you look for Shalom when you hire someone? It depends on the job, right? Correct. So in the cybersecurity sense, uh, there, there are specific needs that, um, with respect to certain uh, uh, languages that they would have to know, not from a, a, a linguistic point of view, but from a technology point of view. Um, then we're looking for the soft skills. Uh, we're looking for uh, their understanding, their, their interpretation, their processing methods, um, their, uh, you know, their ability to calculate and, and make decisions uh, and their decision-making processes. So I think these are all skills uh, that can be put together at the university level. Uh, I don't see that as an issue. Uh, again, I, I can't get involved with uh, what degree uh, or how many years. Doesn't uh, matter to that. You, no. You them for these, but that's fascinating to know, right? Correct. That correct. Industry, mm -hmm. You don't have to, because I think it's people who come in even without, you know, with just bachelor's or something, right? Like you just came in with bachelor degree. And then you learn because you have to, right. it's a new industry and you have to keep up with everything. You have to learn it on, you know. So it, evolves, lot, it evolves so quickly. And, uh, you know, as, as was touched upon it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a combination. I, I think I definitely, I definitely want to see the fact that they do have a degree. Uh, and, and then we expand upon that and say, okay, what, on top of that, what certifications do you have as well? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that makes very, um, it's a very important point. And I, and I think here today we're talking about underrepresentation in the field and how do you provide access? Access is by having programs in colleges that are in the communities with the population that we want to serve. So by offering, starting at a certification, maybe a, someone in the community at the moment can't doesn't have the time commitment to take on a two-year, four-year degree. Mm -hmm. But guess what? They'll start that certification. While they're at the college taking that certification, they're going to learn about the degree programs that are available. So I think access is uh, what we need, and we need more access to these types of programs that can lead them in those pathways. There is another question about uh, uh, of Christopher. I don't know if you already replied this one. How do you deal with the industry input and commitment yet follow through? by industry is someone lacking in someone, no, no, is yeah, someone I lacking. Spoke, I, I think you, to that. That, okay, yes, great. yes, uh, yes, we, we, yes they, they, if someone's not interested, then I need, we, uh, we had someone for the, for the grant that was so interested in helping and giving us internships, and then when we went for a letter, they disappeared. I mean, this is what mm -hmm. happened. 
you just have to, you know, and, but also another thing I was going to say is that include the industry. Like I have asked Shalom to help me with a course that I did where I did an international exchange. I mean, include the the industry and, you know, and, and a networking fair and you'll find that they'll, I mean, Lisa Neck can speak to this too, mm -hmm. that, you know, people are, are interested, especially because this is the way they recruit. Uh -huh. Also, there is a question about Gust uh, Gustavo Pina. He said, in those three certifications are important. How we can help students pay for these? Any grants what I, that, that you know of? Yeah, so at OSTOS, we have our Division of Continuing Education and Workforce Development. Many of the programs that are developed and certifications are aligned so that students can get credit through their certificate and transition to a degree program without losing that time. And the mission is also to be able to support the community by funding these certifications. And there are grants, there are various types of grants, whether it's through the Department of Labor, um, workforce development grants that are that are provided, WIOA. There's many different types of grants that can help support for uh, students who are unable to pay and based on income, of course. We can definitely pull up information and share it um, after so that you can have an example of the different types of grants that are offered. Well, I'll tell you something. Number one, uh, exactly, Lisa, and that there are some, not, there's a, a couple that are offered by, for um, continuing ed that we offer. But the other thing is when, when we were creating, crafting the program, we put the certifications into the curricula so that the students don't have to, you know, can take it separately. I mean, they can learn everything about the certification in the course itself and then take the certification. Great. I think I think the other the other comments that I see is uh, thank you, uh, people thanking for the information. They all of them say it was a great uh, information that you have provided. So one is asking for the link for the certificate that I just put in here a, a already again. So because I think so, no everybody know how to scroll up and down the chat to look for the link. So I'm putting again the link for the certificate. And any other comment on a question? This is the time seeing we are already over the time, but since this topic is so interesting, I always like to relax, to to make sure everybody uh, are are ready with the Bella. Don't go with without any uh, questions. So for the certificate, this is the link. Okay, I see we have a question. Ah, go ahead. How do you keep up with the rapid updates and content, new tools and skills required that the field of cybersecurity requires? That's a great question. Hello. <laughs> uh, absolutely, a very, very good question. So uh, there are many different avenues that uh, we keep up with, whether it's uh, trade shows, whether it's conferences, whether it's uh, reading materials, uh, so it, it, and, and the news. Uh, so you'd be surprised, uh, you know, how many things we learn just from, uh, you know, all these uh, notices of new crimes. But those are the avenues that we, we maintain constantly. But as far as the professors teaching, for example, what we would do is you have to have the input from the industry in the courses and you have to have professional development. And that's what also constantly you have to have professional development because Shalom has explained to us and other people that everything changes. So you have to have the professional development from the, the industry and you have to, and we're gonna let's say have peer mentors with the students, you would also have to have them included as well. As well as for career services, we stay up to date by looking at the industry, what's in demand, what are the roles in demand, what are the salaries, the wages, what are some new educational certification requirements? We also use Lightcast to pull data um, to find, you know, what the real data is. How many jobs are there in this in, in in cybersecurity? What are those specific titles? And again, it's pulling that information, but we also have to get it to our students and our community. Um, so having those resources available are very helpful. But it's ever changing, and I think it's for many of the industries that we support through our academic programs. 
but maybe cybersecurity more. Mm -hmm. Potentially. Oh, definitely. definitely. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. Definitely. But well, thank you. Thank you so much, the three of you uh, in New York, in Ostos Community College, actually one of our, our founding member institutions back in 1993 yes. when HED started as a consortium. So thank you for your active participation and valuable collaboration. Thank you, Lisanne. Thank you, Amy. And also thank you, Cohen, for joining us as well. Thank you so much. Everybody has put in on the chat. Thank you. Another meeting that, that we they would love to have you uh, with more information and update information. So please keep us in mind. It's some, something new that you may want to share. Please count on heads to be the platform to continue spreading the word of this important topic. So thank you again. Have a wonderful day. Tomorrow, remember, we have, it is going to be in Spanish, so the ones who are fully bilingual can be able to join us. Tomorrow, we will have another webinar with Dr. Juan Tito Melendez from Universidad de Puerto Rico here talking about what's next for distant learning. That is another very important topic for heads to discuss about. So thank you again for your uh, valuable uh, collaboration and participation today. And hope to see you tomorrow. The ones who can join in us is going to be tomorrow, Friday, April 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon. I'm going to stop the recording.